In the past 10 years, we saw the slow death of the teen dystopian boom, where a thousand different authors and publishers attempted to cash in on the popularity of The Hunger Games. Since then, the literary world has largely been dominated by a different young adult subgenre, fantasy. Throne of Glass, Fourth Wing, Shadow and Bone, Red Queen, Children of Blood and Bone, Blood Rose Rebellion, Ash Princess, Everless, and Ember in the Ashes, The Kiss of Deception, A Court of Thorns and Roses, Powerless, and a thousand others have been dominating the Amazon bestseller list and bookstore shelves for nearly a decade now. Sarah J Maas is probably the biggest fantasy writer in the world right now, other than maybe Brandon Sanderson, and all she had to do was write smut with a few magic spells added in. The true sign of a genius is that all their discoveries seem obvious in retrospect. That said, this particular subgenre doesn't entirely come from one source. With Twilight clones, it was obvious that one book series got popular and then tons of authors tried to make something like that. Same with Hunger Games clones. With YA fantasy, there were multiple big series that got popular over a period of several years that jump-started this new subgenre, most notably Red Queen, Shadow and Bone, and Throne of Glass. Everything else has just been chasing the success of those three. And that brings me to all of you. You might want to carve yourself off a piece of that success, but you're not sure where to start. After all, these published, well-known authors spent years honing their craft. How could you possibly match them? With a handy-dandy numbered list. Just follow the steps here and you can become a successful author yourself. Your fans will all be very annoying, but their money spends as good as anyone else's. This video is here to teach you a couple of things. You know what else can teach you things? This video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a platform where you can learn all kinds of stuff, with thousands of interactive lessons for learning math, data analysis, programming, AI, and more. Brilliant utilizes a first principles approach, which means you learn everything from the ground up. Every lesson is filled with hands-on, interactive problem solving that's proven to be six times more effective at learning than simply watching lecture videos. And all of their lessons are designed by a team of teachers and researchers from the best institutions on Earth like MIT, Google, Caltech, and more. Brilliant doesn't have you memorize facts or trivia, it helps you build your problem solving and critical thinking skills. This makes you a better thinker while also making you more knowledgeable about the topics you study. Many lessons on Brilliant are only a few minutes long, meaning it's easy to start a good learning habit. Every day you can build real knowledge without moving your busy schedule around. It's much better than mindlessly scrolling social media. I personally like the data analysis courses, like predicting with probability. As a YouTuber, it's great that I have a bunch of analytics to look at, but without knowing how to read all the data, it's useless. And with Brilliant's help, you can learn exactly what works and what doesn't with regards to things like thumbnails and video titles. With the things learned here, I can help grow my channel faster than ever before. To try Brilliant totally free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash James Tullis or click the link in the video description below. You can also get 20% off an annual subscription if you decide you like it. Don't wait. Take the opportunity to improve yourself and your intelligence today. Number one, the government must be evil. Extremely evil. You may think that the YA fantasy boom, and later porn disguised as YA fantasy boom, are separate from the earlier YA dystopia boom. You'd be wrong. It's a continuation of the same thing. It's still about teenagers overthrowing an evil government, only instead of overthrowing a futuristic totalitarian regime via the power of love triangles, they overthrow a monarchy via the power of swords and magic. And love triangles. And, instead of regular people rising up to secure a future for themselves and their loved ones, it's about special people rising up to replace one king with another. Yes, while it can be tempting to overthrow an authoritarian regime and replace it with a liberal democracy, it's much more satisfying and romantic to replace an evil absolute ruler with a good absolute ruler. Thinking and participating in politics and being a responsible citizen is really hard. Why go through the trouble of trying to reform an awful system when you could just give up all your power and let someone else do it for you? Except you. You claimed that monarchies suck. Maybe you suck. Ever consider that? In order to make readers forget that any sort of dictatorship is generally unpleasant, except for the ones that share your fringe ideology, of course, you have to create a strong contrast between the new ruler and the old one. You may have thought that the capital from the Hunger Games was evil, what with their cutting out tongues of criminals, or starving the population, or forcing children to fight to the death on TV. President Snow's got nothing on the villains from YA fantasy, though. The evil king in Throne of Glass is literally possessed by a demon. Literally. Then, like every crappy JRPG in the 90s, he's killed off and the demon becomes the final antagonist. The Commandant in An Ember in the Ashes commits a literal genocide. And it's not off-screen so you can show it to kids like The Last Airbender, it's right in front of the audience. 
In Fourth Wing, the government conscripts the children of rebels to be dragon riders, then most of them are literally killed in training by other recruits. This is mostly stupid, but also very evil. In Blood Rose Rebellion, Austrian Emperor Ferdinand literally steals the ability of Romani people to speak to prevent them from using any magic. That's horrible. Luckily, Austrians have never done anything awful to Romani people in real life, and so on. The government, by which I mean the evil reigning monarch and no one else, can't simply be bad, they have to be the worst you can possibly imagine. That means it has to be worse than the last book your audience read, or they'll immediately forget about yours. The government must commit all sorts of atrocities, ranging from sexual abuse, to wanton murder, to locking up all the super special magic users for no reason other than they exist. If you feel like being subversive and original, just have the people without powers be killed and oppressed. Don't forget to make all the people who actually carry out the orders of the evil government completely faceless goons who have no real reason to follow their orders. Remember, no seemingly regular person has ever been loyal to an autocrat for personal or ideological reasons. Every nasty government in history has been propped up by soulless automatons with no life and no relationships beyond their service to the state. Except for one hot guy around the protagonist's age who forms a leg of a love triangle with her. He was forced into this life. He's a good person, no matter what he's done in the past. No, he doesn't have a redemption arc. He's just a good person from the start. Pay no attention to the crimes against humanity he committed. If this sounds like it might become cartoonish and, ironically, make it have less impact, don't worry. Readers only want the aesthetic of redemption arcs, meaning you can't treat the hot bad boy like he ever does anything wrong. If you acknowledge his crimes, the audience might have to wait a while to like him, and waiting for things is unacceptable. The true horror of authoritarian regimes is not the exploitation they visit upon their populations, nor the torment they bring to those they view as expendable. The true horror is the way they reduce living people to nothing more than resources, degrading the human spirit itself until all that makes life worth living has been ground into dust and forgotten. The way that the autocrats free themselves at the cost of enslaving everyone else and they can't even enjoy that freedom due to burning up their own souls in the pursuit of power. The way that regular people are convinced to go along with horrifying crimes, exposing the fathomless potential for evil that lies within every human heart. Is what I would say if I was a complete dumbass. Charlie Chaplin described dictators as Machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. YA fantasy takes that a step further and makes them statues. No feelings at all beyond what they can evoke from others via their presence. Merely an obstacle for the heroes to overcome. Number two, the protagonist must be a spy. A sneaky spy. It goes without saying that the protagonist of a young adult fantasy novel will have to be a young woman, specifically a traditionally attractive young woman between the ages of 17 and 20. If she has a bunch of sex, she'll be on the older end of that. If she only has a little bit of sex, it's on the low end. Her partner can be as old as you want him to be, though. No matter what others say, there's nothing weird or creepy about older men going after literal teenagers. Maybe the protagonist has ultra-special magic powers that no one else has, like in Throne of Glass or Blood Rose Rebellion. Or maybe she doesn't have any special powers, but she's still the center of the story because reasons such as Ash Princess. You may be thinking that, in this situation, the protagonist could fit into a variety of different roles depending on what type of powers she has. If they're combat-oriented, she could become a linchpin for the rebels in battle. If they're related to mind reading or mind control, she could interrogate prisoners to find valuable information. If she's one of the few people who can ride a dragon, she could be a scout or airborne cavalry. You would be wrong. None of that is possible. Whatever her powers are, she can only have one actual job in the rebellion. She is a spy. Yes, as soon as she decides to side with the rebels, which usually happens before the end of book one's first act, she's sent out to gather valuable information on their behalf. The rebels send her into a dangerous, hard-to-infiltrate location, such as the Royal Palace, or a military base, or the Royal Palace. Sometimes she's even sent somewhere glamorous, like the Royal Palace, where the evil monarch resides. You might think that effective espionage would require training, experience, or at the very least knowledge of what sort of information the rebels need. You would be wrong about that, too. All she needs to do is wander around the dangerous, hard-to-infiltrate location with high security and hope she stumbles across something that might be important to taking down the evil monarch. This goes back to the genesis of the genre. Aelin in Throne of Glass is forced to be an assassin for the evil king, yet also feeds information to people working against him. Then later she starts leading the rebels because she's also a secret princess. In her case, it made sense for her to not only be in that situation, but also be able to look out for herself, because she was a trained assassin, which in this world means she can fight 20 men at once and win without magic. None of that justification is needed, though. Just throw the protagonist in head first and hope for the best. In your book, the protagonist must live in constant fear of being caught by the villain's goon squad. 
Even with her powers, whatever they are, she can't possibly hope to fight them. Since they're so helpless, getting caught by the goon squad will likely mean the end of their mission, and their life. Unless they get rescued by someone else before anything bad can happen to them, which is guaranteed to happen at least once. Maybe the protagonist being completely dependent on others to do anything will make her unlikable and hard to sympathize with, but that's not important. What's important is that she's a spy, and spies are cool. Number three, the protagonist must be special. Really special. By now, we already know that the protagonist is super special, but I need to clarify just how special she is. Because she can't just be in the top 10% of rebels, she can't just be the princess of the super nice kingdom where everyone is happy and no one engages in imperialism, she can't just be the world champion of destroying armies by herself, she needs to be the one and only person in history to even come close to her level. She needs to be someone on the level of Jesus. So incredible, she will be the thing everyone aspires to be like for literally thousands of years. The protagonist can't just be at the center of the rebellion, she needs to have the coolest, bestest, most special magic powers too. These specifics will depend on the setting, obviously. Maybe she can shoot out enough fire to evaporate an ocean. Maybe she can control people's minds. She just feels, like, really bad about it. Maybe she can open tears in reality, allowing barely contained eldritch horrors from beyond the stars to warp her world via their mere presence and scatter her enemies' minds across the endless void that exists within our own heads. That doesn't matter. What matters is that she's so far beyond everyone else that they can't even conceive of reaching her level. The villains don't want to be special like her, though. They want everyone else to be normal. So they focus instead on trying to drag her and all the other special people down to their level by blocking her powers or getting her out of the way of their plans to remake the world in their own image. Oh, hi, Ayn Rand. What are you doing here? She barely needs to practice or train her powers at all before mastering them, too. She just needs to wish really hard and they'll work perfectly. Or at the very least, they'll work by the time the climax happens. If she doesn't have powers, she'll just be really pretty and then people will do what she wants because of it. Oh, sorry, I seem to have mixed up my notes. She'll be an inspiring leader. Someone so incredible that all of society is in awe of her magnificence and listens to whatever she has to say. She's so smart, she comes up with new ideas that no one has ever heard of, like saying racism and discrimination are bad. And she's also really pretty. Everyone who starts off working for the villains will eventually be convinced to fight on the good side. Not for freedom, or higher ideals, or their own economic well-being, or because the villains are destined to lose and they don't want to risk being purged by radical rebel factions, just because main character girl says so. Except for, of course, those who are ugly, I mean, irredeemable. The faceless goon squad, the evil monarch, and any girls who oppose the protagonist will all be dead by the end of the story. Remember when I said her main job was to be a spy, though? That still applies. Yes, in spite of her awesome powers, the protagonist can't actually do any of the fighting or planning or anything else. Other people do the important stuff so she can focus on chasing hot boys and killing the villain in the last 10 pages. She just needs to sit back and let everyone else handle the dirty work. If she had to do something, that would make her less special. A true leader is someone who just sits back and basks in the glory of being a leader. Number four, include fairies. Sexy fairies. For many years, the go-to example of sexy mythical creatures in fiction was vampires. Why? Because a cold, heartless parasite is the most attractive sight known to man. That's why Kevin Spacey is widely regarded as the sexiest man alive. Nowadays, the go-to example of sexy mythical creatures in fiction is fairies. Why? Because Sarah J Maas made a bunch of money by making her protagonists canoodle with fairies and there's no need to put more thought into it. At some point, the protagonist, and possibly her other traditionally attractive female friends, must come across fairies. Not small, winged people, human-sized men and women who are impossibly gorgeous. Yes, fairies are basically just humans, but better in every way. Stronger, faster, immortal, and with insane magical powers allowing them to hypnotize people and turn into animals. Their magic is better than everyone else's, except the protagonist, of course. Why haven't they conquered the world if they're so much more powerful than everyone else? Don't worry about it. Nobody reads fantasy for the world building. All this power makes them irresistible for young women who somehow got access to contraceptives in a setting with medieval technology. Therefore, the protagonist must have consensual, but also very aggressive, sex with fairy men. Don't worry about the fact that this is aimed at teenagers. If they can't vicariously live through someone having kinky love triangles, then their lives aren't worth living. Sorry, did I say love triangles? I meant love four-dimensional hypercubes. Just two hot dudes isn't enough for our super special heroine. Every attractive man, whether he's age-appropriate for the protagonist or not, is a potential love interest and must be acknowledged as such. 
as long as he's hot, but luckily every character in YA fantasy is hot. No uglies exist here, and if they do, they're always villains. Pretty people have never done anything bad. I know what some of you are thinking. Weren't the original myths of fairies focused on how they were tricksters that kidnapped children and hypnotized people? Weren't fairies beyond our comprehension? Weren't they a terrifying combination of childlike whimsy and inhuman cruelty? Doesn't making fairies humanoid and have a bunch of powers that make them better than humans in every way with no drawbacks make them basically the same as the sexy vampires that dominated this section of pop culture for years? Wouldn't leaning into the mysterious and metaphysical aspect of fairies make them more alluring, increasing their sex appeal further? Shut up. Number five, the title must be stupid. Very stupid. There's a specific cadence that all modern YA fantasy novels follow with their titles. A blank of blank and blank. Things like A Court of Thorns and Roses or A Bowl of Mac and Cheese are good examples of this pattern. People say you can't judge a book by its cover and those people are wrong. The title and cover art are what get the audience's attention. The plot and setting are unimportant. You want to give your book a title that makes sure the audience understands that it's a slow burn, enemies to lovers, chosen one, bad boy, love interest, love triangle romance with a fantasy backdrop. Because if it's not a slow burn, enemies to lovers, chosen one, bad boy, love interest, love triangle romance with a fantasy backdrop, then they won't read it. I know I just said that all titles have to follow the same pattern. That was a lie. They don't all have to follow that, just most of them. If you don't feel like giving your book a title like that, then all you need to do is use words from a pre-approved list. Take the following words and rearrange them until you find something that works. Iron. Blood. Rose. Court. Princess. Ever. Queen. Ash. Thief. Fury. Grace. Bone. And Flame. These are the only words that are allowed. If you try to use any others, I will find you. Fantasy isn't about imagination, it's about following strict confines set out by others in a desperate attempt to grab some of those sweet social media clout dollars. And the best way to stand out in a crowded market is to do exactly what everyone else is doing. Number six, the series must be long. Too long. Back in my day, everything was a trilogy. Sometimes that was the appropriate length, sometimes it wasn't. But three books per series was the rule in the literary world with few exceptions. Then someone... <coughs> decided that editing was for pussies. Why try to keep the story tight and exciting when you could add in a hundred short scenes where characters have pointless arguments, angst about their special powers, and gawk at hot people? Subplots can be a great way to flesh out a setting, develop characters, hammer home a central theme, or just allow the audience to immerse themselves in the story further. None of that matters here, though. The best subplots in YA fantasy are the ones that are put in for the sake of having a subplot. Things like the protagonist going to a ball and wearing a pretty dress, or tracking down someone that can help them only to come up empty-handed. Complete wastes of time are the best way to endear yourself to the audience. Don't forget to give every character a romantic character arc. The audience wouldn't be able to sleep at night if they didn't know whether or not the heroine's third cousin's former roommate's neighbor found love. And don't just give them a few lines or a chapter. You need to bring the whole plot to a halt so we can watch them argue with their sexy fairy love interest for 300 pages before getting married or otherwise forever bonded. Throw in more love interests, more MacGuffins for the heroine to search for, add new villains for her to be afraid of and then effortlessly brush aside. Literally anything is acceptable as long as it adds to the word count. More stuff happening means that the audience will spend more time consuming your work, which means it's better. Quality is a fake word for lazy people that don't want to create an endless content machine. Hi Dragon Ball franchise, what are you doing here? The first book in the series should be a reasonable length to draw them in. Then the second one is a bit chunkier, but nothing crazy. Then BAM! Three and onward are doorstops. 600 pages, single spaced, three point font, comic sans. On top of making books longer, publishers realize that if they stretch the story for more books, then audiences would have to buy more of them. And considering how many readers seem more interested in looking like a reader than actually consuming books they enjoy or find interesting, there's a big audience for this sort of thing. Trilogies are arguably the simplest way to structure a series. It's just the beginning, middle, and end of a story separated into three books. Longer series are a bit more difficult to structure properly. The whole series needs to have an arc of progression, with a beginning, challenges for the heroes along the way, and a climax. At the same time, each individual entry needs to have its own arc of progress so it doesn't feel like a waste of time. That said, who needs simplicity when you can have mind-numbing repetition? Take that same trilogy's worth of story, add in a bunch more love scenes, then stretch it to the breaking point. Before you know it, you'll have six or seven books. They'll just be six or seven books that slowly go off track until the audience forgets what the story is supposed to be about. 
It'll be an endless cacophony of stuff happening while the protagonist looks awesome, which sounds stupid, but it is very profitable. And I believe that, more than anything, is why we haven't seen these break into mainstream consciousness the way things like Twilight and The Hunger Games did. They're all aimed at more or less the same audience, yet those got big screen adaptations that were seen by millions of people. If you reference either of them, everyone knows what you're talking about, even a decade after their peak. The average person who doesn't read still knows about Twilight. They don't know about Throne of Glass or Red Queen or Lightlark. While Throne of Glass and A Court of Thorns and Roses did immensely well in terms of sales, they haven't gotten an adaptation yet, which is usually what truly catapults something into being a mainstream phenomenon instead of popular within a niche. It's easy to adapt Twilight, not because it's good, but because it's coherent. It's a very simple story about a teenage girl who falls in love with a sparkly pedophile. Easy to follow, easy to compress into two hours, and easy for someone to check out without much commitment. Watching a movie is usually quicker than reading a book, after all. Throne of Glass, on the other hand, goes through an entire genre shift, from sophomoric fantasy to porn, and the structure of its plot is essentially non-existent. A faithful adaptation of the early books would be Aelin fighting a magical evil king, easy to put on screen as long as you had a proper budget. A faithful adaptation of the later books would be three and a half hours of Aelin smashing her fairy boyfriend and sometimes remembering that there's a demon army she needs to do something about. Now, let's cut away to a side character carrying a MacGuffin while smashing her own fairy boyfriend. It, things just sort of happen across the books, with little rhyme or reason. There isn't much more to say than that. Modern young adult fantasy, or new adult fantasy, they're the same thing, has dropped even the pretense of being anything other than meaningless wish fulfillment. There's no effort put into plot, world building, character, or anything else because that's all secondary, if not tertiary. It's purely there for a small slice of the population to insert themselves into. And at this stage, there have been so many people trying to squeeze life out of the same rigid tropes that the only things left for any of them to do is to either embrace that there's no creativity or try to subvert the basic ideas in some way. It's like isekai anime, but for girls. These aren't stories. They're just noise. Artistically bankrupt? More than I ever thought possible. It certainly doesn't lead to real bankruptcy, though. Join me next time, where we can cast aside popular fantasy romance and learn how to make popular regular romance. Spoiler alert, just throw in a controlling man or two, then add incest. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Hello friends, it's time for yet another outro. All these names? Yeah, these are my patrons. Thanks to them. You can get uh, access to early videos or exclusive content and other stuff if you feel like donating to me over on Patreon. So go ahead and do that. Special big thanks to Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodis, Carolina Clay, Ich bin Langweilig, Carol Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Proscriptions of Zhuo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vevictus, Wesley, and Zenitech89. All of them, they're all great. Without them, I couldn't do this. Consider donating, becoming one of them. If you don't feel like doing that, then like the video, comment on it, subscribe. Maybe check out some of my merch in the store down below. <laughs> I don't have a lot of variety at the moment, but I'm, I'm working on getting some more stuff. Uh, that's all. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.